All right, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. I'm excited about the topic that I have, and uh, we'll try to be timely with this. I know we've been going, going at it for a little while already in our fourth hour. The, t- the title of my presentation is this, Does the King James Bible Best Fulfill Tyndale's Life Mission? And I know, I suspect if you've been over here, over in the other session, we have been invoking Tyndale's name repeatedly, even in our board meeting, the significance of Tyndale came up, and we are, Lord willing, going to be making plans to celebrate uh, his life and influence. He has a significant anniversary that's going to be coming up in a few years. And so I want to answer that question in this presentation, does the King James Bible best uh, fulfill Tyndale's life mission? And I believe that vision that he had, and I'm going to share it with you in a second, uh, is best understood in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Matthew 4 and verse 4, the Bible says this, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And with all his being and all his fiber, fiber, William Tyndale believed this unto his death. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for men um, that have believed what we believed, but to the cost of their life. Lord, we are fortunate. We live in a free society in, in the greatest country where we're able to espouse these beliefs with no fear of uh, repercussions. We're not worried about imprisonment or um, being martyred for these beliefs. Maybe the ridicule of the brethren, but Lord, that, that's nothing. But here we're going to hear about um, your child, your saint, your uh, believer in Brother Tyndale, uh, Lord, that, that believed this so much that even death could not persuade him to believe otherwise. And so, Lord, Lord I pray you would help us now uh, to be able to see what he saw and to share in our own lives and hearts the same conviction. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. William Tyndale is known as the father of the English Bible. You cannot tell the story of the English Bible without being introduced to William Tyndale. And out of all the characters over here, to me, he's my favorite. I and mean, he is the most, one of the most exciting and dynamic. He, he really lived a, a hero's life. And uh, often referred to as God's outlaw. He was born in 1494 in England. And we're going to see over the next few moments that William Tyndale was not only a preacher, but he was also a printer, a translator, and a political revolutionary. And, uh, and this is really what I want to try to grab a, grab a hold of because um, we are affected. Even people today in America are affected They're living under the the freedom that William Tyndale burned for, even if they do not love the Bible he burned for. Um, His guiding belief was that an Englishman should be able to read the Word of God for himself in his own language. And the, the story that pops out the most about William Tyndale is his encounter one day with a Roman priest. One day, Tyndale was dealing with a Roman clergyman. And the clergyman said it was heresy to spread the scriptures to the common man. So you, you got to believe, Tyndale, you have to understand, Tyndale did not live in a world where you can go to the dollar store and get a Bible. He, he did not live in a world where you can get a, a Bible on your app. He, he lived in a world that was actually devoid of the word of God. And it was not because of lack of uh, interest. It was actually being oppressed. It was being jailed down. It was being uh, incarcerated. The Roman church held captive or hid away the word of God from the people of God. They said that God's word was too hard to understand with the help of the approved church doctors. The priests went so far as to say that the scriptures aren't necessary for the common man. The priest boldly said to William Tyndale, we are better to be without God's laws than the Pope's. And so we we better have the Pope than the word of God. And of course, just saying that runs against every one of your sensibilities. And it runs against all of my Baptist sensibilities. Tyndale then replied, and we're going to take this as his life mission, his vision for his ministry, I defy the Pope. That's a good ministry. (laughs) That's a good ministry to have. I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, 
I will cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you. And the gauntlet was dropped. Uh, In common vernacular, he dropped the mic, uh, if you want to put it that way. Tyndale issued a challenge that he was willing to see all the way to his death. And you can see in this rebuke of the, of the Roman priest, Tyndale's life vision and life passion. Now, now, a little bit of a side here. Oh, that we would have another generation of men that would be so enthusiastic for something so right. Uh, that we would have another generation of young people that be, would be willing to give themselves, all of themselves, for a noble cause. And not only for a noble cause, but for the word of God and for the right cause. And this was the heart of Tyndale. Oh, that we would have a heart like he had. Well, what is this vision he had? I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you. Well, what was it that that Tyndale was envisioning? I want you to see three things. First of all, he was envisioning an an available Bible. The plowboy has to be able to get it. So, so in this statement, you understand this is like this is like akin to Kennedy saying we're going to go to the moon, not even knowing anything about rockets himself. He didn't know what that meant, but we're going to have to go. To, we're going to go to the moon. We're going to accomplish this. And so, when Tyndale made the statement, he understood that there was certain things that this meant. Number one, this meant that the Bible had to be available to the plowboy. You see, it wasn't available to the plowboy. He couldn't just go get it the day Tyndale spoke these words. Not only did the Bible have to be available, but it had to also be accessible. What do I mean by that? The plowboy has to be able to read it. The plowboy has to be able to read the Bible that Tyndale was envisioning that he would be able to get his hands upon. And then lastly, I want you to grab a hold of this because this is where we're going to end. He had to have an authoritative Bible. He had to have an authoritative Bible. Not only an available Bible, not only an accessible accessible Bible, but he had to have an authoritative Bible. The plowboy had to have such confidence that he has the word of God that he will break free from centuries of oppression. So you got to understand, this is what he was saying. This is what I'm going to give the plowboy. I'm not, not only going to put it in his hand, and what I put in his hand, I'm going to make sure he can read it, but I'm going to make sure, or my vision is, that he is so confident in his reading that the programming of oppression that he was born under and his parents were born under and his grandparents were born under and his great-grandparents have been born under and a thousand generations of his, his family had been born under that he would have so much confidence in what he had in his hands that he was reading that he would break free of that. He would run away from it and, say, and, and unloose the shackles that was holding them down. What a grand vision. What a grand vision that Tyndale had. And our, and our proposition today, and our question is, is the King James Bible the fulfillment of that vision? I propose to you today, the King James Bible continues to best fulfill Tyndale, Tyndale's noble vision of a Bible available, accessible, and authoritative to all English people. First of all, the King James Bible is the most available English Bible. It is the most avail- available English Bible. Tyndale was, if you want to say by trade, a printer. Some, and maybe even seen the documentary, have labeled Tyndale as God's outlaw. And he was given this, not simply only because of his political or his religious beliefs, but because of his printing activity. The printing and reproduction of the Word of God into English was illegal in the world that Tyndale lived. The church was both the religious and the legal law. So imagine the church now is not only equipped with, uh, and I'm talking the pseudo church, the Roman church, is is equipped with not only the conviction of their pulpit or the the, the guilt of their, uh, their indulgences, but they also had a governmental arm. In other words, they can enforce it with the sword that you had to believe or do what they said. And so the printing of God's word was illegal. Tyndale spent a major portion of his ministry as a fugitive printer running across Europe, finding places uh, uh, 
Dr. Stringer's book, uh, The History of the English Bible, has a good synopsis of this. And there's some other texts that you're gonna, you'll see out available that talk about uh, Tyndale the fugitive running from place to place, printing God's word, shipping them back to England. Um, one of the stories goes that as Tyndale was printing them, that the, the Roman church in England was purchasing them to destroy them. And, and his compatriots said, well, let them buy it. Let them do that. We'll take the money and we'll take the profits and we'll print even more Bibles. I like how that guy thought. I mean, listen, we need a little bit of that kind of thinking. You know, a little bit of take the gloves off and, and, be, and let's outsmart our enemies a little bit. Sure, buy it all. We'll just print more. That's, you're actually funding our work. Tyndale found himself as this fugitive printer. He believed that every word is necessary for every man to know his responsibility to God. When we look at this portion of Tyndale's life and we examine it and put it under the, the King James Bible under this filter, we come to understand that the King James Bible continues to be the most printed Bible of all time. It is the most available. Outside of commercial selling, which it still ranks among the best of sellers of, of Bible texts. But, but we, especially the, the circles that we are influential in or, or come from, understand that the commercial printing and selling of the King James Bible is just a small portion of the King James Bibles that are being printed and distributed around the world. Millions of King James Bibles have been, are being produced annually by Baptist organizations for at no cost and being distributed all around the world. Uh, that's where my notes originally end. In Dr. Sorensen's session, he threw out this, uh, this stat, and I, had to, I started typing real quick. I had my computer open. Dr. Sorensen says, let me quote him, that there are 6 billion King James Bibles in print today. Could you imagine that? Now, I'm citing him because I don't know where he got that number from, but I believe it. It works. Six billion. Six billion King James Bibles floating around the globe. Now, beloved, if that's not a secondary proof of God's hand on this text, then you do not want to be convinced. See, the word of God, Jesus taught every word for every man. It's the bread. And so we see the King James Bible today is still the most available Bible for all of mankind. Now, with its supposed competitors, we have to then issue this challenge. If Tyndale's vision, um, Brother Hayfley was talking about the ESV, and every new Bible translation wants to invoke Tyndale as its foundation. In the line of Tyndale, and so the ESV says in the same lineage of Tyndale, the King James Bible, and the ESV, which is a lie. Right. That, that's not true. It's, a, it's two different lines. It's not the same lines. And if you're not going to be in the same line, then you do not get to invoke Tyndale. Right. We get to invoke Tyndale. You don't. you got to find someone else. <laughs> Tischendorf. That's who you get. You take Tischendorf. We'll take Tyndale. That's a good book, that's a good book, Tyler, isn't it? So let me propose this. For any modern Bible to even enter the discussion, then its publishers must be willing to release it to the masses with the only the mechanisms of printing and the energy of distribution as its limiters. In other words, if we're, gonna, if we're talking about which Bible today best fulfills the vision of Tyndale, then for any, for any other Bible to even get in the arena, then it has to be available. It has to be available with the least amount of limitations. And so the only limitations is we physically got to print it, and someone has to be willing to distribute it. And so now you take the realms of that. Uh, now, now listen, we're going to talk about copyright here in a second. One now, but you take that apart. Which Bible have people been willing to, to print at their own dime and be willing to, to distribute at the sacrifice of their own blood, at the sacrifice of their own children? It's only the King James Bible. And so the King James Bible in this aspect of the availability is second to none. 
It is not more available. If you're going to be in a foreign land and you're going to, you're going to run across the Bible, more likely than not, you're going to run across a King James Bible. Secondly, the King James Bible is the most, not only available, but it's also the most accessible English Bible. That we can grab a hold of it. Tyndale was a translator. He was a translator. Now, that's not a bad word. Properly defined and properly understood, we actually embrace that word. Praise God for translation. Praise God that he endorses translation. And praise God that translation exists. Otherwise, I would not have a Bible in the English language. We need translation. That's not a bad word. And Tyndale was a translator. A contemporary of Erasmus, he actually studied under Erasmus, a student at both Oxford and Cambridge. Tyndale was skilled in Greek and Hebrew and Latin and a number of other languages. His translation, and we see examples over here in this lineage of Bibles over, uh, over here, was ultimately completed by Miles, Miles Coverdale following Tyndale's martyrdom and is the foundational English basis for the King James Bible. The King James Bible that you hold in your hand preserves much of his work. The work that God allowed him to accomplish. The translators realized they didn't copy it, they validated it. They said, no, that's right. Tyndale got it right. Tyndale got it right. I would argue in this sense of the translation that the King James Bible is the completion of his vision. Is the completion of his vision. What he envisioned would happen and the proofing process, ultimately leading with the, tr the 54 translators and their, the, pro the proofing by, and translating by committee was the ultimate completion of his vision. An English Bible for every English man. In the King James Bible, we see that the Bible has now been, become, has been made accessible to all English speakers. The, Bi the King James Bible today continues to be the most read Bible by English speakers. Now, if you were to look up some statistics on this, you would find that at the high, uh, if you woke up, this, uh, people that were polled, if you woke up this morning to read, your, read a Bible, that 85% of daily Bible readers read the King James Bible. That 55% of people who, uh, that, that in, in polls that own Bibles, of people that own Bibles, that over 55% of people acknowledge in a poll today that they own a King James, or that they own exclusively a King James Bible. I say this in quoting Mark Twain, the reports of its deaths are greatly exaggerated. For those that would say that the King James Bible is no longer accessible or is no longer, if it was no longer accessible, then it wouldn't be used at the rate that it is being used today. There are millions upon millions of English readers today who have no problem ac accessing, accessing the King James Bible every day as they read the Word of God. When you go to the Christian bookstore and you find the Bible section, and you see, uh, and, and you find the Bible section, and, and you go to uh, the King James Bible, and, and you see the section there, and you go to the NIV Bible, and you go to the ESV Bible. What you ought to understand in, as, you're looking, as you're looking in there is that instead of being labeled by version, these sections should be labeled by publisher. Zondervan. Exclusive rights. Crossway, exclusive rights. Thomas Nelson, exclusive rights. It's only when you get to the King James Bible that you have the multiplicity of publishers who have all have access to be able to print this Bible. It's like the soda water aisle at Walmart. They don't put the colas together. They put all the Pepsi together. They put all the Coke together. And then for those of you Michiganders, they put all the Fago together. <laughs> And Verner's. 
They sell it by branding, not by type. And this is how the Bible is sold today. The King James Bible still sells. It is still accessible. It is still accessible and available. The question has become, is the, is the English of the King James Bible still accessible to the English reader? This is a question. I think I was watching the live stream. And I saw Dr. Levesque held up, hold up a book, the book Authorized. And this is the premise of that book. Is the English, uh, is the English of the King James Bible still accessible to the English reader today? Well, let me give you a couple of thoughts about this quickly. First of all, it's still English. People act like the, the King James Bible is a foreign language. It's English. Uh, the King James Authorized Bible has, a, uh, has 783,000 words in it, approximately. In the Old Testament, there's 10,867 unique words. In the New Testament, there is 6,063 unique words. The complaint of many Bible detractors, excuse me, the complaint of many King James detractors is over a very select few unique words. We're, we're talking over 14,000 unique words in the King James Bible, 14,000 words, that all of these words are accessible to the English reader today. And the complaint is over scarcely a dozen words. And these words, we could simply classify that they're not archaic words. They're simply Bible words. Right. But we want to throw out 14,000 words that we all understand, all for the scope of a few dozen words that are supposedly hard to understand. The logic of this reasoning then demands that a text is tied to literacy, not accuracy. Think about that. The logic then demands a text or the Bible text is tied to literacy, not accuracy. Now, understand this. We need to be sympathetic to literacy. But loyal to accuracy. By going through this logic, my two-year-old my sixth daughter, who doesn't seem to be as advanced as her older daughters were because she has five other humans that do, do everything for her, <laughs> has taken very little interest in some things, and one of them is reading. She's, she's just not, no, no interest in ABCs yet, no interest in all these things. Why should I? I have siblings that do this for me. But according to the logic of a text driven by literacy and not accuracy, the Bible picture book that, you, that we give to her that illustrates Bible stories, by that definition, we have to call that a Bible. And that is not a Bible. My two-year-old who can't read, but, doesn't, but that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that I should call her picture book a Bible. So these words, the English language is still accessible. The problem, of under, the problem that we see today is not... The problem, the, the problem today is a problem, uh, the problem of understanding is not literary accessibility, but rather biblical understanding. The problem of understanding that many are claiming is an archaic problem, it's not, a, it's not about literary accessibility, but rather biblical understanding. You're familiar with the story, Acts chapter 8, verse 30. Philip ran thither to him, the Ethiopian eunuch, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except a man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he, had, which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before the shears, so opened he not his mouth. What? The Ethiopian eunuch lacked was not the ability to read the word of God, was he needed someone to help him understand the word of God. He, was, he, under, he could comprehend the words. And so what people are mistaking today as the Bible being not accessible is not a literary problem, it's an understanding problem. Now, 
as we win souls and we lead people to Lord Jesus Christ, one of the very first things you tell a new convert is you need to read your Bible every day. Here's a Bible. And you give them a Bible. Sometimes maybe some of you have even given them your own Bible. And when you tell them to start reading the Bible, where do you generally tell them to go? Their, their inclination is to go to the book of Genesis. I'm going to start at the beginning and go all the way through. But you understand, for a first-time Bible reader, that's a hard path through. Let's get you, let's get you to the place, let's get you to the book that's all about the identity of who Jesus Christ is, your new Savior. So we send them to the book of John. Okay, so we send them to the book of John, and of course, we understand that we understand that right in the very first word of the book of John, uh, first verse of the book of John, we are introduced to the Word. The Word. He is the Word. But you got to understand, to a non-Bible reader who does not have Bible understanding, what a strange context that must be. The first reading through, they're not picking up that this is. What do you mean, the Word? A person. Uh, they're, 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 it's not that they don't understand the word that is being said there. They can literally read it and they understand what the word, what the word word means. But as they under, come to have understanding of the word of God, they begin to learn what the words mean. This new Bible reader will continue on down into verse 14. And the Bible says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And they go, oh, that is who the word is. Follow my line of thinking here. Many of the examples given of archaic, archaic, archaisms or archaic words in the King James are given without the context. Context helps determine definition. So you can't, it's not enough to, to claim, we have to throw out this Bible because this archaic word exists. No, no, no. Put that archaic word in the context of the scripture that it's around and see if the average reader can't figure it out. Can't come to a definition. Rather than throw the baby out with the bathwater, allow the word of God to do what the, what, the whole, what the word of God says the Holy Spirit will do in that believer's life. It will show them these things. Let me illustrate it this way. If we were to delete all the words in your Bible that started with the word, with the letter K, and left a blank instead, and you read your Bible, you would probably still get it. You would still get it. You would know all the words that had K were missing. And at least the blanks would communicate to you that something is gone. And so as you were reading through, you came to a word, and there was a word, maybe the word kind, and, and it, it existed there. And so in this, in this uh, hypothetical situation I'm, I'm giving you here, instead of the word kind, there was a blank. And so you would have to stop for a second, and you had to go, I wonder what was in that blank. And I bet you, and, and this is all, I haven't done this scientifically yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident in this that if we were to do that and you were to read through the Bible and use some context and look at that, you would be able to figure out what that word was. That, that's why what that, that word that was erased or that, that, that because of this trick, that, this game that we're playing, I could figure out, and especially if I knew it started with K. Those of you that like crossword puzzles, who go, oh, that'd be, kind of, that'd be a fun game. I, I could probably, from context, figure out what that K word was. Because the context defines the words. The words don't exist by themselves. They exist in the environment and the economy together. Now, if I change the words to something easier to understand, but less accurate, you would never know what you are missing. So if I didn't take the words out with the letter K and put a blank to let you know I took something away, but in, instead I insulted your intelligence and said, you know what, you can't understand that word. You, you're not even going to be able to figure out the context of that word. I'm going to completely change that word to something that does not reflect an accurate translation of what God said. 
you will read through that. You will accept it because you trust it because it, on the front of it, it says a Bible, even though it really isn't a Bible. Uh, and you will trust it, never knowing that you're missing something. I'll get to the point here. It's all right that there are some hard words in there. The hard words, rather than changing them, should cause the reader to stop and contemplate the meaning. So they come to the hard word. Stop for a second. Get some context. I, 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 bet you, I bet you can get at least whether or not that's kind of a positive word or a negative word just by the context. And you can work through these things. But let me tell you this also. Because we believe it's a divinely inspired book. And we also believe that those do not, who do not have the indwelt Holy Spirit, are, the Bible tells us, will not understand this book. But those that do have the indwelt Holy Spirit with the divine inspired word, you have a teacher with you every time you read the Bible. You have the author. Not only are you reading the author's words, the author is inside of you. And so he helps you figure out those things. We should not judge the validity, the accessibility of, a, uh, uh, of the word of God based uh, on how well people can read it who do not have God's spirit in them, but rather those that do have God's spirit inside of them. Now, in the context of all this, let's say in the conversation we get down to the couple words. The, the, the hard words, the, the words that aren't used anymore. And, these, and I'm telling you, this, this is a handful of words. You just heard how two of the words that are, that are they're like that aren't even like that. They're, they're good words. They're the right words. But even if we had those things, I want to propose to you this. The danger of disrupting the text is greater than the value of updating the text. The, because they never only change the one or two words. They change a lot of words. And they, once you disrupt the text, once you say, oh, we're going to do this, we're going we're to we're have the boldness to change one word, now we're going to have the boldness to change a lot of words, and now we're going to have a lot of the boldness to change other words to slant this text a little bit more to my doctrinal persuasion, because we all know that's what it really meant in the first place. The danger to disrupt the text is far greater than there would be in any value in updating the text. Habakkuk 2.2 2 says this, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. The prophet is talking about the vision of God, the word of God being made plain, accessible, so that the reader would know how to follow its instructions. A moving target of an evolving text is less accept, accessible than a stable text purified by 400 years of English speakers. A moving target is harder to hit than a still target. Ask the buck that got away from me this year. Because he was moving fast and he was completely safe with me shooting at him. The moving target is less accessible. And as Bibles continue to evolve, and as translations go off and come on, the accessibility that, 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 that uh, Tyndale envisioned is weakened or is lost. Those Bibles do not fulfill it. The words must be accessible so that they can be followed. Lastly, this is probably one of my favorite point in this whole thing. The King James Bible is the most authoritative English Bible. Not only was Tyndale a printer, not only <clears throat> uh, was Tyndale a translator, but Tyndale was a political revolutionary. In 1528, Tyndale published a book entitled The Obedience of a Christian Man. The book was an argument against papal authority, particularly over the English-speaking people. In it, he argues the political theory of the divine rights of kings. 
Now, understand, they were trying to get underneath a thousand years of oppression of Rome. So the idea is, at least let's have, instead of having a, 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 a Roman king, let's at least have an English king. And so he begins, he, he, he uh, introduces this idea of the divine right of kings that is original with Tyndale. Now, Henry VIII grabs a hold of this, and you're familiar with the story. He would grab a hold of this, declaring the act of supremacy, thus breaking England from papal control and establishing the Church of England. This was, all in a, this was all so that he could divorce Catherine of Aragon and later marry Anne Boleyn. Tyndale opposed this action. In other words, Tyndale said, that's not why I wrote this book, for, for you to divorce your wife. What I was trying to say is, we're not underneath papal authority. But his argument is based on the premise that men should be free to read the Bible for themselves. And this was a revolutionary idea. This was a crazy idea. This was um, uh, one that, that, that the common man didn't even think was possible. Tyndale said this, how can we wet, W-H-E-T, how can we wet God's word that is put into practice, use, and exercise upon our children and household when we are violently kept from it and know it not? How can we use God's word and teach it to our children and our households when we are violently kept from it and know it not? Now, a little side note here. That's a prime example of colloquial English during Tyndale's time. We, there's the argument that, that the English of the King James Bible is how they walked around the streets speaking is not a valid argument. It's an English distinct unto itself. That's another, that's another lecture. By keeping the Bible away from the people, the Roman church cruelly oppressed men from knowing God. And beloved, that's cruelty. That's cruelty to deny a man a fighting chance, a chance to know God, because we all know that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that everyone will stand before judgment before the God and before God. And to not give them a chance to know the word of God is the greatest of all injustices and cruelties ever placed upon mankind. He believed daily Bible reading revealed the power of God to an individual, thus negating the need of a priest. The church believed an unregulated Bible would lead to an uprising of nonconformists, which it did. Nonconformists to their way of thinking. Because a readily available Bible will lead men to conform to God's laws, not man's laws. The only ones that have to fear an unchained Bible are tyrants. That's the only ones that have to fear an unchained Bible. This is why we have to understand today, this is the motive behind the attack of, the, of God's word in secular culture today, particularly even the government's attack. When tyrants rise, they, hold in, they take away the Bible from the people of God. This is true today as well. This concept that Tyndale was espousing is the concept of the individual priesthood of the believer and individual soul liber liberty. And these were politically revolutionary concepts. Both concepts only exist in the presence of a free Bible. These are not only religious, but also political concepts that have changed the course of history. The King James Bible is the English Bible that brings men into proximity to the very words of God, thus producing these political concepts. The proof is in our own American history. I want to recommend to you a book by Michael Ferris. This is one of my top ten, top five favorite books, and it's entitled Tyndale to Madison. And you might have read a lot of Tyndale books, and you might have read a lot of Madison books. He's the father of the Constitution. But Ferris here makes a very powerful argument 
that you do not have Madison and the First Amendment without Tyndale. And he draws the line through, through the English, through English history and the English Civil Wars, and of course, to the founding of the United States. Madison is the father of the Constitution. The Constitution, I'm going to give you the, the one second version here. Madison is the father of the Constitution. The Constitution is not ratified without the Bill of Rights demanded by the Virginian Baptists led by John Leland. John Leland is a close friend and associate of Madison and heavily influenced Madison concerning the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion and prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That is Tyndale's vision. The First Amendment is Tyndale's vision. That, that the free exercise of religion. In other words, that you can, you have the individual priesthood of the believer and, the, and individual soul liberty, that you can have a your sacred conscience before God. This is a political doctrine built upon a Bible doctrine. What does this have to do with the King James Bible? Our King James Bible is the Bible of the founders. There's one great safe assumption you can make as you read history. That if you're quoting a president who is quoting the Bible, any time before 1885, he's quoting the King James Bible. Not only is it the book that made our language, but it's the book that made our world and our government in our country. The political, the vision that Tyndale had of a free people, I don't know if he could, I don't know in his mind he could ultimately envision America, but his vision produced America. Because now you have a Bible available to English speakers. It's available because of printing press, you have a Bible that's accessible because it, it codifies and unifies the English language. But now you have a Bible that is so authoritative that men will hold up, will cling to their Bible and defy the very tyrants that oppress them. And the Roman church, can, or the Roman church was that, but nothing else could produce that for a thousand years until we had an English Bible, yeah, yeah. until we had the King James Bible. And it is the only force in all of human history that has proven to be so potent. That men would hold to these words to their very death. Uh, our founders said their very sacred honor. They would hold to these words. A constantly evolving text leaves every generation in bondage to the priest of that text. So Tyndale said, it's got to be available. The plowboy's got to get it. Tyndale said the plowboy's got to be able to read it. But Tyndale also said, this plowboy can no longer be dependent upon you. He, he doesn't need you anymore. He won't need the priest. And yet today, under the guise of scholarship, we have a new Sanhedrin of priests who determined to stand between the people of God and their God telling them what the Word of God is, depending upon them that we will tell you what the Word of God is, and as we find new or as, as the political spectrum changes and we need to allow the Word of God to evolve, we will continue to allow it to evolve uh, in front of you. And this has brought to us bondage. It is a free Bible, a Bible that is available, accessible, an authoritative that allows man to live in liberty. Paul said this, 2 Corinthians 4, 2, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And there was Tyndale's vision. And so, yes, will answer our question. The King James Bible is the fulfillment and continues to fulfill the vision that Tyndale had that God had laid in his heart. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you that we have it. Lord, thank you for these amazing men. I pray that you would help us. Lord, we, we couldn't hold a candle to Tyndale, but Lord, I pray that we would have the same sympathies, same perspective. Lord, and it's called upon, Lord, that we would take the same stand. Lord, we love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.